Hi, everyone. This is the second lecture of week 11. Again, this is a kind of shortened week, so you'll have uh, less videos. Also, um, you won't be tested on, uh, you'll be tested on the materials on these videos in the next week's quiz, not this week. Uh, where there, we won't have a quiz, okay? Again, a reminder to please read the biblical text as I'm going over these stories very quickly and they will not make a lot of sense unless you've read the text ahead of time, okay? Um, last time we discussed the oppositional characteristics of Elijah and his nemesis, the evil queen Jezebel, um, and nothing really, you know, makes this opposition uh, as apparent or uh, clear uh, as the way that their lives end okay and interestingly we are told that elijah departs the earth before jezebel does and and the, and the story of how is found in second kings uh, chapter two okay second kings two describes how elijah knowing that his time on earth is coming to an uh, to an end you know goes around visiting all his kind of you know prophets uh, other prophets prophetic colleagues you know in order to say uh, goodbye so he's really on a farewell the farewell tour here and trailing him on this tour is his number two right uh, his protege the similarly named alicia okay and i'll try to say number two to make it clear but you know okay. um uh, and okay so he's so number two alicia is trailing elijah while he's going around saying goodbye uh to his friends and colleagues okay and and despite being told several times by elijah, elijah his kind of master Okay, um, that Alicia, number two, that uh, he should leave, you know, Alicia, that is, you know, he still refuses, you know, he's going to stick with his master till the end. Okay, and, 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 and so, and, and until, of course, this, uh, this happens. Okay, so this is 2 Kings 2, verse 9. And when they had crossed, uh, Elijah said to Alicia, you know, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. And Alicia said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. And he responded, ooh, you've asked the hard thing yet. If you see me as I'm being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. And as they continue walking and talking, a trade of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into the heavens. And Elisha kept washing and crying out, father, father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. That's to mourn, okay? So before Elijah, that is his master, okay, departs, he asks, you know, his protege, Elisha, you know, the number two guy, okay, what he wants um, before he goes away. Okay? And Elisha replies, um, this very mysterious uh, request, right? He desires a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And to this request, you know, Elijah says, well, it's, you know, it's, this is hard, but not impossible, okay? Um, to get it, Elisha, that is a student, the, the number two, you know, he has to witness his master, Elijah, being in a departure, okay? Being the de departure for some reason in order to make this request um, happen, okay? Now, there's many questions about the request and what it actually entails, okay? Because it doesn't make a lot, a lot of sense, okay? And, you know, so some argue that this request for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, you know, maybe this is about um, Elisha, that's number two, you know, the student's status as Elijah's true heir, you know, as firstborn sons, you know, they would, you know, as we saw with Jacob and Esau, you know, they would inherit the double portion of the inheritance, okay? However, I mean, you know, perhaps, right, although it's very unclear, right? Um, indeed, what it doesn't address, this answer, is that, you know, the problem with Elisha's request is that this is a wacky thing to ask for, Okay, he is asking for double of something that cannot be doubled, right? Um, spirit, this word here, uh, the, the Hebrew word here is ruach, okay? And of course it can mean spirit, but it can also mean a kind of windstorm or a storm of some sort, okay? Uh, uh, you know, and notice how um, Elijah gets picked up by a storm, okay? Anyway, um, and so um, now let's just take the normal translation as spirit here, you know, and the problem with Elijah's requ Elisha's request is that, you know, how can you double the spirit? You know, spirit is not, it's not like M&Ms, right? I mean, it's not something quantitative, like, like you can't count it, okay? So what is double this thing you can't count? What does that mean, 
Okay. Um, now I have my own answer for this, which you're not going to find elsewhere, which I'll tell you in a moment. Um, if you want a fuller answer, um, I do have, I have written a feminist commentary where I discuss the story and other stories. Um, and you'll, so, you know, I would say, yeah, I will send you there to find a fuller answer. Okay. Um, Anywho, so after asking for this confusing and difficult thing, um, it states that while Elijah and Alicia are talking, they're separated by chariots and horses of fire, and Elijah is picked up in a whirlwind, right, and taken up to heaven, okay? And, 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 and to this, Elisha, that is a student, you know, number two, you know, he cries out, my father, my father, the chariots of horsemen, chariots of Israel and his horsemen. Uh, we're not quite sure why he cries that, uh, you, you know, um, we're not sure what this phrase means, right? It might have been a title for Elijah um, and Elisha maybe as a prophet who has divine powers, um, like maybe the ability to call horses and chariots of fire to his side. Some wonder whether um, as prophets, they were um, kind of envisioned as the horses and chariots, that is weapons, um, fiery weapons, that is of God. I mean, you know, maybe it's a title of sorts, right? Um, you know, it's not really clear, okay? Um, what is clear or what is evident is that the, um, you know, the way that Elijah is taken, you know, with the whirlwind and with fire, um, again, you know, is meant to show that it is Yahweh who is the true storm god, right? You know, who has thunder and rain and so forth, okay? Um, now, considering that Elisha, number two, um, indeed sees his master Elijah, um, depart and even you know as the narrative goes on in the part that I didn't read you know he we are told he picks up Elijah's his master's mantle and, and kind of replicates um, Elijah's last miracle uh, which is to part the waters of the Jordan you know it does seem that Elisha that is number two the student has inherited um, his master's spirit okay what is not as clear is how it is the double amount and, and how the double amount is reflected in the stories about Elisha, okay? Now, rabbinic writers explain um, his request and its reception by stating that, well, Elisha, the student, you know, he performed double the number of miracles that his uh, teacher did, you know, that Elijah did, okay? But um, again, this is like the similar with uh, the Ten Commandments, right? Eh, double the number kind of depends on how you do the counting, right? Where you divide up the miracles, okay? Um, Indeed, despite this attempt to explain uh, this request for double the spirit, the problem, you know, is, um, you know, well, you know, the problem is that Elisha, you know, even if he is said to have done double the miracles, right, he's not really shown to be a better prophet than his master Elijah, okay? Indeed, one can even argue that Elisha is um, worse than Elijah when Elisha, that is a student, when he dies, you know, he's not taken up to heaven like Elijah. Instead, he just kind of dies a normal death, right? As if he's the lesser, okay? So then, what is this double measure or double portion of the spirit about, right? Okay, well, um, and, and this is my take on it, you know, it, it is, it, it's unclear, um, though it is unclear uh, whether Elisha, that is a student, is better than Elijah, the master, right? Um, you know, what is clear is that um, Elisha performs very, very, very similar miracles, um, indeed behaves a lot like his master, um, Elijah, okay? Um, Elisha, that is a student, or number two, like his master, Elijah, regenerates food, resurrects a dead per person, performs uh, miracles, functions as a spokesman for God, especially during wars. He predicts the future, um, especially in desperate times. Indeed, Elisha is so similar to his master, to Elijah, that it is as if Elijah never really goes away. Okay, just kind of replaced by this other clone who is like kind of like named very similarly, you know, it's no coincidence I'm calling Elisha number two. Okay, he, he literally is like Elijah number two. Okay, um, and, and this I think is what I take to, uh, and you know, me, the, you know, what I think the double spirit actually means. Okay, so my interpretation is that Elisha's request for doubles of spirit is not a request for something like tangible, okay? Rather, it's a way for the writers to show you that Elisha, that is number two, is indeed a double, a copy, the number two version, okay, of Elijah, okay? Um, and, and, and so, okay, so why does the writer want to emphasize that Elisha, number two, is a copy of Elijah, number one, okay? Well, um, notice how this whole chapter 
centers on how Elijah, the master, the original, right, never really dies. Okay. Recall also that the whole point of Second Kings and of Kings in general, really, you know, First Kings, uh, the Book of First Kings in general, um, and, and especially this rivalry with Jezebel that Elijah has. You know, notice how all of that centers on um, who, you know, is it Yahweh or Baal who is the true storm god? That is who, Yahweh or Baal, you know, who is the true god who can regenerate life and food? Okay. And, and, and that's why Elijah is, uh, you know, um, and Elisha following him, you know, is shown as doing so much resurrecting, regenerating food miracles. Okay. Because that's really the thing at stake. Okay? Um, I think the double spirit, double portion of the spirit thing really is another way to assert that Yahweh is, you know, not Yahweh, not Baal is a true regenerative storm God. Okay. And, and how does it do this? Well, it asserts uh, this kind of very, I think, strong theological message by, by showing how Yahweh is so filled with life-giving power, so regenerative that his prophet, his messengers, right, they don't even die. Okay, what do they do instead? They kind of clone each other and continue on their ministry forever, like Elijah and Elisha do. Okay, uh, that cloning power, which authenticates Yahweh's identity as the true storm god, that's what is implied or insinuated by the request uh, by, uh, of Elisha for a double spirit of his master Elijah's spirit, a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Okay, something which Elisha, Elisha, that is number two, receives as shown by not how many miracles he does, but shown by uh, or authenticated by how Elisha so effectively mimics or repeats or doubles the very thing that his teacher or his master did before him. Okay, again, if you find this a little confusing, I would ask you to turn to the commentary, okay? Um, at the end, the important point that the narrative is trying to make is that Elijah, the famous, the most famous probably, uh, prophetic representative of Yahweh, the true storm God, the God of life and regeneration, well, you know, this guy does not die, okay? Now, there is one other guy in the Hebrew Bible that does not die. This is Enoch before the flood, okay? And this lack of death of Elijah, and so we'll see with Enoch too, um, you know, but certainly with Elijah, um, this is why um, Elijah has such a rich post-biblical afterlife, okay? The thinking is that Elijah, um, he must not have, you know, God must have not allowed him to die. Why? Because he has, God has future, special future plans for him, okay? And so um, Elijah becomes associated with having to, you know, with these future mysterious plans, okay, that he's going to have to return to do some other stuff, okay? And indeed, in Malachi 3, verse 24, or in the Christian Old Testament, chapter 4, verse 5, okay, uh, we are told that Elijah will come um, back again before the day of the Lord. This is when God will come back, okay, a day of judgment, really. Um, and it states in Malachi 3, verse 24, Lo, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the coming of the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Okay. Um, hence, um, this becomes, a, you know, this verse becomes kind of reinterpreted um, in later um, texts, right? Um, and in later Jewish traditions, you know, Elijah, um, yes, he comes back, you know, before the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is reimagined really as the, you know, when the Messiah comes, okay? So it's really Elijah who is expected to return as the forerunner of the Messiah, Okay, and even today, you know, during the Passover Seder, um, there's an extra cup of wine, okay, Elijah's cup, it's always placed on the table, why? In anticipation of his return, and therefore the coming of the Messiah, okay? Indeed, the, the New Testament writers, um, a lot of them who are Jews, right, um, certainly some of them knowing Jewish tradition, um, they will reuse and spin this kind of, you know, Elijah not dying story um, in their own writing. So kind of spin it and reinterpret it, okay? So for example, in the New Testament, the writers argue that um, Elijah has already come, you know, oh, who is he? Well, he's Jesus's, you know, the Messiah's forerunner, i.e. John the Baptist, okay? So Matthew, for example, states of John the Baptist, you know, he is the Elijah who is to come, okay? This is in Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. Also, you find this in the other uh, Gospels, Mark and Luke as well, okay? The Synoptic Gospels, okay? 
Um, Elijah also interestingly appears uh, with Moses as Jesus is trans at Jesus's transfiguration, Mark 9. And, and this is in part, though I don't have time to talk about it. Um, if you look at Elijah and Elisha, they are actually the doubles of another double, Moses and, J and Joshua. Okay, so they're actually quadruples. Okay, but anyway, I'm not going to go into that here. Um, and finally, okay, you have um, Elijah, and not only Elijah, but the other guy that doesn't die in the Hebrew Bible, Enoch. Uh, they make another appearance in the New Testament in Revelation, the most mysterious of texts. Okay, uh, Revelations 11 tells of two unnamed prophets who will appear on the earth just before the mysterious seventh seal is opened and just before the day of God's wrath. Okay. Uh, it states in Revelations 11.3, and I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire pours from their mouths and consumes their foes and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, and these prophets are killed by the beast and then resurrect themselves. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into Revelations here. I am not really the authority to do that. Okay. Um, uh, Christian uh, tradition um, argues that these pre-apocalyptic figures are who? Elijah and Enoch. Okay. The important thing to kind of get out of all of this is that, you know, notice how much of the prophetic stuff in particular from the Hebrew Bible is picked up and reused by the writers of the New Testament. Okay. Now, um, I've just done a summary here. Um, if you have questions about the New Testament, I would highly emphasize, you know, I would stress to ask your New Testament professors, not me about that, um, as they know the New Testament stories much better than I do. Okay. Um, what's important to note is the importance of Elijah. Okay. And how this importance or significance of Elijah becomes greater um, or bigger in later traditions, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that he is said not to have died a normal death. Okay. And his lack of death is not only meaningful in later traditions, but, you know, as we'll see in the Hebrew Bible as well. Um, and this is especially the case when we compare how he dies um, to the way his nemesis Jezebel dies. Okay. And for that, turn to the next video.